Chapter 1. My Search for a Better Way to Treat Cancer Ever since I was a young boy, I've been passionate about seeking the best solutions for helping others beat cancer. My passion was kindled because of one person, my beloved grandmother. It is because of her that I became interested in oncology, the study of cancer, which led me to become one of the leading practitioners of the amazing, minimally invasive, image-guided technique that delivers maximum benefits of immunotherapy directly into tumors that this book is about. When I was 10 years old, my grandmother was diagnosed with breast cancer. The news was devastating. I was close to her, and during her sickness, I became even closer, visiting her several times a week. She worked at the local high school in the cafeteria. She was a very good cook, and we spent many hours talking about food and how to prepare it. Those talks not only sparked my love of cooking, but of science, because she was always coming up with new ideas and discussing the science behind how to create the most flavorful foods, whether it was how to roast a chicken perfectly, make a perfect pie crust, or whip up a stiff meringue. But perhaps my most memorable times with my grandmother were on Sundays, when she'd make spaghetti with the best sauce I ever tasted, along with one giant meatball. I sure miss those meals. Over the next two years, she grew progressively ill, and by the time I was 12, she passed away, and along with her passing, I lost those wonderful meals and conversations. But I gained an insight into patient care and illness that have stayed with me to this day. Having watched how badly she suffered during her final years as she endured chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation, I thought there had to be a better way to treat such a terrible disease. Maybe there was something right under our noses. I thought something that we weren't noticing, something that would be more effective and less torturous than the agony of cutting off body parts poisoning the patient, and burning them from the inside out. I was only a child, but I knew there had to be a better way, and I would do my best to help find it. When I started college majoring in chemistry, I became interested in gene therapy. I was fortunate to be able to enter a summer research program for gene therapy used in cancer treatment, a joint project of Tulane University, Louisiana State University, and Ochsner Hospital in New Orleans. While working under the direction of some of the most gifted scientists in the field, I became enthusiastic about the future of gene therapy as a first course treatment in cancer. The potential for gene therapy to radically alter how we treat disease was nearly limitless, but two things about it really stood out. The first was that although there was a long way to go in research, the potential for gene therapy to enhance the immune response against cancer was significant. The second was that in order for gene therapy to work, it probably had to be delivered directly into the tumor itself. Tucking those two ideas in the back of my mind, I returned to school that fall excited about my future career in medicine. When I entered medical school at Louisiana State University in 1996, I was determined to be an oncologist, but by the end of my first year, I attended a lecture that would change that plan and set me off in the direction of image-guided procedures. The lecture was on the topic of interventional radiology, which is a minimally invasive way to use CT scans, ultrasound, and x-rays to help physicians treat a variety of health problems. Up until that point, I thought of radiologists as being limited to making a diagnosis, but not necessarily treating patients. Interventional radiology was somewhat unknown at the time, but was rapidly growing. Imaging techniques normally used to make a diagnosis can also help physicians to expertly guide needles or catheters through the body to reach organs or arteries without having to cut open the body. By using interventional radiology, the doctor can literally see inside the body, thereby delivering life-saving technologies and medicines with minimal risk to the patient. 
The physician who was lecturing us on this topic was discussing the many ways that interventional radiology is used in the clinical and surgical settings. At one point in the lecture, he showed how it was used to perform image-guided biopsies of cancer at almost every location in the body without surgery. At that moment, my memories of what I learned about gene therapy a few summers earlier came back to me, and I realized that the future of cancer treatment would not be limited to delivering medicines by mouth or through an IV. The future of cancer treatment would focus on injecting these medicines and other technologies directly into tumors through imaging, not surgery. I started spending as much free time as possible hanging out in radiology labs and reading up on the latest advances in radiology, a field that was taking off as the technology was rapidly changing. I absorbed all the information on interventional radiology as fast as I could read it attending every lecture on the topic that I could, and discuss my interest with every professor who would take the time to listen. Then one day, a professor suggested that I contact one of his former radiology residency graduates working on image-guided ablation of cancer. Ablation, precisely defined, is destroying something. The term is used more broadly to refer to freezing or destruction by heat right inside the body. I learned that my professor's former medical resident, now a professor, was inserting needles into tumors using imaging and then killing the tumor directly by freezing it, a process known as cryoablation, or heating it up with radio frequencies. This was the most exciting thing I'd heard in all of my medical training. I imagined my grandmother having been spared the mastectomy that disfigured her the poisons that had so debilitated her, the loss of her hair and body functions that had so humiliated her. Even if she hadn't ultimately been cured, if there had been a less invasive, more precise way to target the tumors in her breast, she could have enjoyed her final years in much less pain. I contacted the physician who was teaching and practicing at the University of Mississippi and arranged to spend the summer in an externship program where I could observe him in practice and learn as much as possible about his remarkable treatment. That summer was an eye-opener for me, and my own future in immunotherapy and cryoablation was set. I graduated from medical school and entered my residency in radiology at the University of South Alabama and shared my enthusiasm with our professor of interventional radiology. I explained that I wanted to apply ablation techniques to cancer treatment using interventional radiology, and he told me that if I could set it up, we could do it. I began contacting medical equipment companies to get the necessary equipment and writing articles on the topic. I started a website, and soon we had patients. I even contacted news outlets, and it wasn't long before we had more patients than we could handle. With all of these, the future specialty of interventional oncology was born. One of these patients was the mother of a medical colleague who had been treated for breast cancer. Her cancer had spread and she developed lung metastasis. When we examined her, we found that she had four lung lesions, two in each lung. At that point in time, we only considered ablation when the disease was limited and mostly only in the liver because it was the easiest to treat through our method. But our colleague pleaded with us to make an attempt because with the tumor spreading to the lungs, it was clear her mother would die soon if something wasn't done. So we decided to give it a shot. I felt that treating both lungs at the same time would add a lot of risk. But if we broke it up into two procedures, treating one lung first, and then another several weeks later, we stood a better chance of the patient not running into extra complications. So we went ahead with the first procedure using computed tomography, CT. Computed tomography is an imaging procedure using special x-ray equipment that allows us to see detailed images of the body's organs, similar to what would be seen if you were able to cut right into them. Using CT, we guided our needles directly to the tumors 
and use radiofrequency ablation to heat up the tumors and destroy them. The procedure worked. Those two tumors had not only been killed, they were completely gone. A few weeks later, our patient returned for the second procedure. We had prepped her for surgery and did the scan to determine exactly where the tumors were. And what we saw astounded us. Or better yet, what we didn't see astounded us. The other two tumors had also disappeared. We had done nothing to them. She was not receiving any chemotherapy or any other treatments to explain the disappearance of the tumors. But they had disappeared. It was at that moment that I realized that the ablation had stimulated her immune system, essentially acting like a vaccine of sorts. When I thought about it, this made sense. Vaccines are made from weakened or killed forms of disease microbes that are injected into the body. Once they are injected, the body's immune system then develops antibodies to attack the microbes, thinking they are a danger. We had killed the first two tumors using ablation. Perhaps in the process, we had stimulated the body's immune response to attack the other tumors. We had helped our patient and made an astounding and intriguing scientific discovery. We still had a long way to go, but I was on my way to what would become a 17-year journey to determine how to make that successful outcome the norm and not the exception. There was not much data at the time on how ablation could stimulate an anti-cancer immune response. And, as I was to find, that one case was not a common occurrence. But the fact that it had happened was enough for me to know that it could happen again once we had a better understanding of the process. I began researching ablation in tumors and found literature dating as far back as the 1960s where other procedures using crude ablation techniques, such as putting liquid nitrogen directly on tumors, had resulted in a complete immune response. The possibilities were clear. We just needed the right drug or combination of drugs to inject into the ablated tumor to make it happen. As my work in the area of immunotherapy and ablation continued, however, I was to discover the road to success could often become the road to ruin. Insurance companies would no longer cover the ablation procedures, and it wasn't long before the university put a stop to our work in that area because they were not being compensated. Fortunately, the chairman and residency program director of my department recognized the importance of my work and supported me in the efforts to continue. After I arranged to use facilities outside the university, he told me that if I wanted to take a leave from my residency and focus on the procedure, I could do so. He gave me two years before I had to return to finish up my residency, and I accepted. I spent the next two years focusing exclusively on ablation. During that time, I had other patients with advanced stage cancer who showed complete responses after being treated with ablation, including more tumors disappearing that had not been directly ablated. Of those with advanced disease who ultimately did not survive, I still noticed that they did much better and lived longer than expected. I was convinced that the immune response had something to do with it. By 2005, I began exploring what agents could be injected into the tumors that could enhance more positive responses and result in more cures. The immunotherapy agents available at that time were extremely limited, mostly just interleukin-2 and interferon. It was also at that time that I learned that another researcher in the Netherlands, Martin Den Brock, was also pursuing the same research. He had published several animal studies showing that ablation does cause an anti-cancer immune response. Den Brock was also interested in CTLA-4, which plays a critical role in cancer production. CTLA-4 is a protein receptor that suppresses the immune response. Den Brock was studying the experimental immune checkpoint inhibitor anti-CTLA-4. The current anti-CTLA-4 drug is more commonly known as ipilimumab, or Yervoy a medication that would later be approved by the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, in 2011. 
It was this drug that really started everything moving in the immunotherapy front, though it would mostly take a backseat to the more popular PD-1 inhibitors, such as Keytruda and Opdivo, which would get approval a few years later. This is not to diminish the value of CTLA-4 inhibitors. They are just as important, maybe more so, in the right setting. Denbrock also used studies from mice to show how the vaccine adjuvant Matrix M, or saponin, enhanced the immune response of ablation. This finding was significant and energized my pursuit to explore cancer and the immune response. I applied to the company making Matrix M so that we could try it ourselves. Although it had not been approved by the FDA, this agent was well studied and close to approval as a vaccine adjuvant, so we got a waiver which allowed us to use it. The technique of combining Matrix M with ablation had never been tried before in humans, so the patients I was treating would become the first to undergo this procedure. Starting with three patients, we combined ablation with Matrix M injected directly into their tumors. The first patient, MC, patients are not named so as to protect their privacy, had a non-small cell lung cancer. After a couple of ablation treatments, In combination with Matrix M, her tumors disappeared. Eight years later, as of this writing, she is still alive and well without any recurrence of her cancer. The second patient, SM, was more challenging. He was 80 years old and had stage four renal kidney cancer. He had numerous tumors in his lungs and his kidney, which had the original cancer removed. He had failed all the latest and greatest treatments for kidney cancer we had at that time. Because he was older and had numerous health issues, we decided we could not be as aggressive with ablation as we would have liked. Consequently, we performed a cryoablation of one lesion and injected Matrix M into the tumor. Over the next few months, we were amazed to see that all but one of his tumors disappeared. That one tumor never really grew, however, remaining about one centimeter in size until he died six years later. And when he did die, it was not from cancer, but from an infection that he had acquired following an injury to his leg from a fall. Although he had been given less than six months to live at the age of 81, following the ablation and Matrix M injection, he had lived to be 87 and was spared the long and devastating death that cancer so often brings. The third patient we worked with that year, GM, was 32 years old and had stage four colon cancer, which had advanced throughout his body. There were tumors in his lungs and throughout most of his liver. Although we performed the ablation with Matrix M and the initial results were good, the cancer did come back. He lived a few more years, which was longer than expected, but died at the age of 35, right when we were making our real advance with immune checkpoint inhibitors in late 2014. These three cases had demonstrated that we were on the right path and encouraged me to continue my exploration in this area. There were rough years, and at times, I found myself discouraged as I continued to battle many obstacles but I knew I couldn't give up. I took a private practice job, which kept me busy and limited the time I could devote to ablation, but it allowed me to have more money to put into my research. As I spent the next few years looking at different agents and combinations of agents, the road certainly didn't get any easier. I had dedicated my entire life to this quest and my personal and family life suffered for it, and I suffered as well. My father pleaded with me to just be a regular doctor, telling me he didn't want me to end up like so many other scientists who had made great discoveries. Reminding me of the story of Nikolai Tesla, probably one of the greatest scientists in history. My father pointed out that despite his contribution to science, Tesla had lived a very sad life and was never fully appreciated, at least not while he was alive. But I was driven. There was no way that I could stop. So like sons so often do, 
I did not listen to my father's advice to become a regular doctor and continued my research in immunotherapy and cancer and doing everything possible to help my patients defy the odds and eradicate their tumors. I'm happy and grateful to report that my persistence and ongoing research has paid off. Since those early years, I have treated thousands of patients with advanced stage cancer and had remarkable results, including numerous complete remissions and cures. There have been more struggles than I can detail, but it has all been worth it, and I think very soon these treatments that I now specialize in will become the standard for cancer therapies. As you will learn in the pages that follow, immunotherapy is rapidly reaching the mainstream as a viable cancer treatment, in part due to Jimmy Carter's remarkable remission. Combining immunotherapy with cryoablation or direct injection of these medications into the tumor is even more promising. Read on to find out why. In the pages that follow, I will first discuss some of the basic principles of immunotherapy so that you'll have a better understanding of what the treatment is, how it works, and what it entails for the patient. As you read, you may come across medical and scientific terms that confuse you. If so, don't despair. I've done my best to explain what each is and highlight the important aspects that can enhance cancer treatment. I purposely did not want to make it into a science research book but more of a guide for the patient. I have included the information needed to do further research. I strongly suggest that any patient do their own research, since no one has more at stake than you. As with any outside recommendation, you should always also discuss these with your doctor, but the final decision needs to be made by you. In the chapters that follow, you will learn all that you need to know to decide wisely.